Now let's take a look at the parietal lobe. So let's first have a look and see where its boundaries, its anatomical boundaries are, so we know exactly where we're talking about. So firstly, the parietal lobe is generally located here, behind or posterior to the frontal lobe, but anterior to the occipital lobe. So we've got the parietal lobe sitting here. Now, its barriers anteriorly are the groove right down the middle that we spoke about with the frontal lobe lecture. Remember that this groove or sulcus down the middle is called the central sulcus. So let's write that down. Central sulcus. And remember in the frontal lobe video, we said that the groove anterior to the central sulcus, or just in front of, is called a gyrus, but it's called the pre-central gyrus because it's before the central sulcus. We're going to talk about the groove that's after the central sulcus. This is obviously going to be called the post-central gyrus. And we need to talk about that because the post-central gyrus is located in the parietal lobe. Post central gyrus. So how is the postcentral gyrus different to the precentral gyrus? Well, first thing is that the precentral gyrus, which is in the frontal lobe, was there for motor movement. The postcentral gyrus, which is in the parietal lobe, is there for somatosensation. So sensory understanding. Somato means body. Sensory obviously means some sort of input from the environment. So somatosensory means input or sensations from the body. So this is, can be pain, temperature, touch from the hands or arms or legs or torso or head or tongue or face. This is somatosensory input. And it comes into the body right here at this postcentral gyrus. So that means it has to travel from a sensory neuron, let's say at your fingertip, for example, down your arm into the spinal cord, up, through to the brain, and then the thalamus, and then project out to this somatosensory cortex. And that's what it's called. This strip, just like that being the motor cortex, this is the somatosensory cortex. So it's important that the somato part is there because it means body. So it's not viscero, meaning organs. This is, think about, again, parts of the body that pain, temperature, touch, feet, legs, torso, abdomen, arms, head, whatever it may be, okay? Just like we did with the frontal lobe video, remember we did a frontal section and we viewed in and I showed you what was called the motor homunculus, so how the parts of the body are mapped to the brain. Well, we've got the exact same thing happening for the sensory cortex or the somatosensory cortex, is various parts of the body are mapped to the brain, but a little bit differently to that of the motor cortex. So again, let's say we've done a frontal section and now we're looking in frontally or from a frontal plane to this somatosensory cortex. Now let's map the body to it. So, just like with the motor cortex, we've got the feet down here. Then we've got legs. Then we've got abdomen, neck, and then the back of the head, not the front of the head. Then we've got the arm and the hand. Then we've got the face. It's supposed to be a nose. <laughs> then we've got big lips. Then we're going to have, actually what I forgot here is genitals, which is obviously quite important. And then foot, genitals. And then here we're going to have tongue. And then we're going to have pharynx, which is the throat and then we're gonna have esophagus. Okay, so what do we have again for somatosensory? Genitals, foot, leg, torso, back of the head, arm, hands, face, lips, tongue, pharynx, esophagus. Now, just like with the motor cortex, what you're gonna find is that it's not due to the amount of the, uh, the somatosensory cortex that's dedicated to a part of the body, doesn't have to do with the size of that area, it has to do with how many sensory neurons are present. So think about the areas of our body that are very sensitive to touch. So very sensi sensitive for touch is genitals, is hands, is 
lips, for example, and that's why the genitals, which I didn't necessarily draw too large, but the genitals, the hands and the lips and the tongue are quite large in this somatosensory homunculus or topographical image because there are more sensory neurons dedicated to that part of the body. Okay, and it's very important. Another important point here I'd like to add is that sometimes strokes can occur or bleeds on the brain, which can, or lesions, for example, which can damage certain parts of this somatosensory cortex. Now, I want you to think about what can happen if, so let's just say somebody doesn't get a stroke. Let's say somebody has lost their limb. So let's say the limb's been lost maybe uh, in an accident or maybe due to uh, some sort of diabetic neuropathy, but the arm has been lopped off. Now that means that that arm is no longer present for that individual, obviously. But the sensory neurons that were in the hand, well, there's still more proximal aspects or distal aspects of that sensory neuron that's still present that goes into the spinal cord and up to the brain. The only thing that's missing is the part of the neuron that was at the hand, for example. But that means the part of the brain dedicated to picking up sensory input for the hand is still there. But is it receiving any sensory input? And the answer to that is obviously no. If there's no hand, there's no sensory input, go into that sensory neuron telling the part of the brain dedicated to the hand, I've just felt something. So what that means is that this part of the brain here, for example, starts to get starved of sensory input. Now the brain loves sensory input. It always wants some sort of sensory input coming in. So what happens then? Well, not in all cases, but in some cases, due to the process of what's called neuroplasticity, where the brain and the connections within the brain can start to form other new connections with other parts of the brain, this can start to happen with somebody who's lost a limb. And that means that this part of the brain which is originally starved of sensation, dedicated to the hand, well, it starts to talk to neurons that are adjacent to it. For example, it starts to talk to neurons of the face. Now what that means is this, sometimes, not always, but sometimes you can go to an individual who's lost an arm and you could rub down the side of their face and ask them what they feel and they can say, well, I'm feeling you touch my cheek, but I'm also feeling you touch my pinky finger, ring finger, middle finger, index finger, and thumb because of neuroplasticity, because of these neurons starting to cross connect and have conversations with one another. Okay, so that is the somatosensory cortex, that is in the postcentral gyrus. It's not the only part of the uh, parietal lobe that we need to talk about. There's two other gyri that we need to refer to, or gyrus. One is the supramarginal gyrus and the other is the angular gyrus. Now basically the supramarginal gyrus and the angular gyrus are located just behind the postcentral gyrus, so the somatosensory strip. And so let's just say that this one here is the supra marginal there's an L there, gyrus and this one here is the angular gyrus why do you need to know these two? well supra marginal gyrus and angular gyrus are quite important when it comes to language Damage to these particular areas have shown to manifest in a couple of different ways. So one way is that an individual can forget what word they need to use, and that's called anomia. It can also result in issues with reading and writing, which is known as alexia and agraphia as well. It can also result in issues with trying to know what the right word is to use in a sentence. Importantly as well, the supramarginal gyrus, now this is predominantly damaged to the left hemisphere. Remember, when it comes to language, language is predominantly lateralized, predominantly located to the left hemisphere. That means Broca's area that we spoke about in the frontal cortex for speech production, predominantly left hemisphere. Wernicke's area, which we're going to talk about for the temporal lobe, 
predominantly left hemisphere, supramarginal angular gyrus for language and these issues with language, predominantly left hemisphere. But if you look at what happens if you've got damage to these areas in the right hemisphere, well, and left hemisphere, it can also result in issues with uh, empathy, understanding another individual's emotions, also being able to interpret their gestures and their postures as well. This is something interesting to do with mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are neurons that light up when you watch someone perform a particular action that's you neurologically performing that action as well and mirroring what they're doing. It allows us to be able to understand what someone else is doing or thinking simply through their actions. The rest of the parietal cortex you're going to find is known as the association cortex. So the associate, now remember that's temporal lobe, but this is the parietal lobe. The, pretty much the rest of that parietal lobe is the association cortex, and it has to do with somatosensory association. So sensory association. What it basically means is this. When you have some sort of sensory input come in to the primary sensory somatosensory cortex, which is at this post uh, central gyrus, it needs to, that's raw data, that's raw data coming. Let's just say you put your hand in your pocket and you feel something. That's going to the somatosensory cortex. But for you to understand and know what that thing is in your pocket, you need to pull upon the different feelings. So the, whether it's smooth or hard or rough or cold or hot or whatever it may be. And then what you do is you pull upon the somatosensory association cortex to on previous experiences. Have you felt this before? If it's smooth, what else have you felt that's smooth? If it's round, what else have you felt that is round? And then you can finally come to the conclusion, ah, it's a coin or a key that I'm feeling in my pocket. So that's a somatosensory association cortex. And that's a very brief look at the parietal lobe as well. In the next video, we're gonna have a look at the temporal lobe and then the occipital lobe.